Hi guys, welcome back again. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about five ways to cut the cost of your building project here in Ghana. Okay, now the reason I'm doing this is because we get contacted by so many people who want to build a house here and honestly speaking, some of your budgets, right, are like really pushing the boundaries like your budget is so small so I just thought it'd be really nice today to maybe sit down with you and talk about some of the ways that we have now realized that we could have cut costs in certain areas um, perhaps some mistakes that we've made along the way that you don't necessarily have to make you can learn from our experience because even if you're into building it's not everything that you can apply from the west to here in Ghana so there are going to be some differences some things that you may not notice okay so I'm just gonna jump right in there and we're just gonna get started is that all right so number one is buy your materials in advance okay? I know that I've touched on this before, but I'm saying it again because I feel like it's so important. From what we have seen here, materials here go up so fast. Honestly speaking, labor is not your biggest issue. It's definitely not labor. Your biggest issue is going to be materials, the cost of materials, and in particular, iron rods and wawa boards. They're the two things that are so expensive. I mean, cement is expensive as well, but uh, I've not seen as much of a jump in cement as I've seen in the others, especially iron rods. Iron rods are crazy. Like I said, I've said before, when we first came to Ghana, a ton of iron rods was 1,500 cities. Now iron rods are crazy. <coughs> Excuse me. Iron rods are, depending on where you go, they're around the 5,000 mark. So it's gone up a lot. And you might think, oh, well, you know, when you do your calculations, you know, do, 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 that you know well it's only gone up by what like three and a half thousand which is not that much because how much is three and a half thousand let's take a look three and a half thousand cities is like 430 pounds 430 pounds is a lot of money but when you have to times 430 pounds or let me say in dollars for those of you that talk in dollars $579, okay, when you're starting to think that, okay, well, you need to deck and you need 10, 10 tons of iron rods, so when you times your 570, whatever it was, what did I say, $579 by 10, now you're talking big money, so it is a lot of money, so literally your budget can go from being full and overflowing to in the negative region very very quickly just simply because of something like iron rods they go up a lot and i'm sure they will continue to rise so if you have a place of storage a place you can tie it down i mean iron rods can be left outside so you only need a place to tie it down so that they can't be stolen once you have that buy your iron rods put them down trust me you'll thank yourself later i mean even to give you a bit more perspective on it um, when we started doing this house like two years ago about two years ago now iron rods at that time were 3500 so you can see the difference is still quite a lot you know so if you can afford to put your materials down do that cement unfortunately you can't put down because it will cake if it's left for too long cement has to be turned around really quickly so don't make that mistake and buy your cement in advance just don't do it while we're bored definitely you can buy that in advance but you have to have a place of storage don't just leave it outside to get wet because it will eventually damage so if you've got a place to store that, do that. That is my first and foremost and probably one of the most important tips um, that I have for you today. Okay, tip number two, okay, is buy as a collective if you can. We all know that there is power in numbers, man. The more of you, the merrier, because if there's like five of you that are all building at the same time, and you're going somewhere like B5, where they sell as like wholesale iron rods, you've got more buying power than you have as you and one individual person who just wants one ton of iron rod. You're gonna have no move, movement there at all, absolutely none. Like, they won't, they won't even mind yourself, you know, so just forget that. So if you're going as a group, and you know you're, you're buying like, I don't know, 
20 tons of iron rods or 30 tons of iron rods, you're going to have a lot more bargaining power than you are going as your lonesome self and trying to um, bargain with, with over the iron rods. It's just not going to happen. So the more that you can do things as a collective, the better. Even for that one, we can actually join the... Um, the cement in this one because when you're all ready to use cement and you go as a collective you can definitely use your buying power there in order to purchase bulk you know um, so it just if little things like that they make a difference because even if they only come down by like one city two cities maybe even three cities if you're lucky it really does help trust me it takes a like I don't I can't even tell you how much cement that we've used on our house here at the moment we have used so much cement the bags of cement that you go through even just for casting i think we used how many bags did we use i can't remember i don't want to i don't think i even really want to say because i could be saying something completely wrong but i think the last time when we were buying boxes of cement i think we used about 200 bags or something like that and right now cement is 50 cities a bag so 50 cities can you imagine yeah it's quite a lot so when you're talking about numbers like that, and that's just for one thing, that's not for the whole building, by the way, that's for one thing, okay? So when you start talking about numbers like that in the hundreds and stuff, you should definitely, definitely, if you can, work with other people who are in a similar situation to you and so that you can get your cost reduced, because let's be real, right? The, ev everything has a markup, um, no matter what, unless you're going to the, the factory where they're actually producing it to buy it yourself, you're paying a markup on something, so... Sometimes there's usually um, some type of room for manoeuvre in there in order for you to be able to get more from there. Um, so I would definitely be creative when it comes to those things. For us, we didn't really, when we started, but we didn't really know a lot of people who were building at the time. Obviously now loads of people are building, but before we didn't really know anyone that was building. And so we were just like trying to shuffle our way through and, you know, we we're just doing our own thing. But I think in hindsight, if we were able to, have more of us doing the same thing, I think it would have been easier for us and cheaper, definitely. Number three, coordinate your trades. Oh gosh, okay, now. I know that I go on and I, you know, I have this little joke about being project manager, but honestly speaking, you do need a project manager. It's so important here. You need someone to be able to coordinate the trades, okay? Um, for the most part, I don't do that. I don't really, I don't really get into conversation with the trades about stuff like that. Kwame does all of that. You know, I just, I'm like, I'm like the face of the project manager, but I don't actually do any of the project managing, really. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, you need to have someone who's project manager that can coordinate trades because it costs more money to have, say, a plumber come in and put pipes in and then have to go and wait for another trade to come in before he can continue. It takes longer and it costs more because he's going to go and he's going to come back and all of that. If you can get trades, if there's something that you're doing, um, like perhaps you're working in one room and there's something you're doing where you know that, oh, it would be handy to have, like at the moment we're doing some work upstairs. Right now, it was handy to have the steel bender and the carpenter here at the same time because having them at the same time meant that they could work together on certain things and there would be less room for error as well. So... If the carpenter wasn't say, wasn't happy with something, he would tell the steel bender, the steel bender, and they could work together to resolve the issue. So little things like that actually really, really help to reduce the cost because it, it meant that oh, the steel bender hasn't just like finished and gone, and now the carpenter's left and like oh no, we've got to call the steel bender back because guarantee you, right, the steel bender ain't coming back to work for free. He's coming back with a charge. So if you can get people to work together in that sense, it does help a lot. Again, another typical example is the plumber and the electrician. If you can get them to work together, then it saves you cost because you have less instances when someone needs to come back and change something or um, you know, one person has put something in the wrong place and it's disturbing the other trade's work or anything like that. So if you can do that, that's good. But I know it's not always possible here in Ghana, you know, there's no trade that comes and sits down and waits for you until you finish your project before they go on to another project. Most people, or most trades, should I say, will come in, do a particular job that you're paying them to do, and then they'll go. And if you need them back again, you're like, you likely have to wait for them to finish at whatever other job they're doing before they'll come back. And so it can also slow down your progress as well. And so it's kind of a bit frustrating in that sense. So 
you may have been waiting to rely on a trade to do something and you can't move now because another trade is finishing off a job somewhere else but if you had coordinated these two two trades to work together at the same time then you would have done you know so it's just little things like that can make things easier and bring down the cost as well so that kind of leads me on to my next point which is day rate versus contract rate Now, these two things, you have to get these two things right. Choose one and choose carefully, okay? So what I mean by day rate and contract rate is, do you want a trade to come in and just pay them a daily or do you want them to just charge you for a whole job? Now there are pros and cons to, either, to, to both of these, okay? So if you want a trade to come in and you only want to pay them a day rate, just bear in mind that you will have to be on that person because you know what? That person is trying to get some money. Let's be real, we're all trying to eat here. The person is trying to get some money. So he's not going to put his whole vim of fire into, oh, I'm going to lay the block. They're not going to rush and do it that way, okay? Because you're paying them by the day, all right? So they're not in a rush to kind of lay. 200 blocks for you in a day or 150 blocks for you in a day, they're not going to. They're probably late, if they're meant to lay 150, they're probably late in 100. You know, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, it depends on the integrity of the person, but they're certainly not going to break themselves in order to finish your job for you quickly when you're paying them a day rate. Now, if you decide that you want to pay that person a contract rate, they will go fast, trust me. In comparison to you paying them a day and you can pay them a, a contract rate, if the day rate was going to take them five days, trust me, the contract rate would probably take them three days or two and a half days to do it because they'll be more, they have more vim to get through the job quickly because the quicker they go, the quicker they can move on to another job and so they benefit in that way. So they will have all the fire and all the vim to go fast when it's a contract job. Now, the reason I said there's pros and cons to both, you might be thinking, oh, well, then you should always pick contract. No, you shouldn't. You shouldn't always pick contract because sometimes contract work can be also overpriced, okay? So, for example, if you had um, someone who was going to charge a day rate of, say, 100 cities a day to do whatever, I don't know, lay blocks or whatever, 100 cities, now the contract job was going to take, I don't know, um, the contract job was going to be 500 cities to complete the work. Now, you know that, you know, by buying it, doing this person um, a day rate, you know, you just buy them some small food, some small drink or whatever, they might finish that job in three days. Do you know I mean? If they're happy with you and you know they like you and everything goes well, you know they could finish that in three days and you have saved yourself 200 cities. Yeah, let's just be real, okay? Even though they may not be as fast and be like have all the fire fire in them to do it, they will still complete the job quicker than if you had given them um, the contract. So the contract rate. So it really depends. You kind of have to gauge which one you think is going to be better off. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It happens. It happens to us sometimes. You know, you just have to gauge what you think will work best. You know, there are some trades that come in that, you know, it's more skilled and so it's going to take more time. So perhaps maybe doing it on a contract would be better. But then there are other trades where it's just like, oh no, come on, you could just, you know, it's, it's, not, that, it's, it's not that big a deal. You can pay someone a day rate to come and do, I don't know fix your water tank or whatever, just pay them a day rate. Do you see what I mean? It just depends, so you have to just kind of like try and gauge it, but that is definitely one area you can absolutely save money in. And number five, and my last point, is finalize your plans ahead if you can. Okay, so we all do drawings, do we not? We all do drawings of this wonderful house and how we'd like to lay it out. And we're so specific about how we want to walk through this corridor and enter this room and it's going to work absolutely beautiful. It will all come together like cake. Oh no. And what happens is that you start to see the building go up and then you're like, oh no, this doesn't flow well. This doesn't look right. And they've already built the wall. Now you have to break the wall down because you don't like, you don't like the entrance where the door is to your bedroom anymore. So you get them to move it. The fact that they've already built that wall and you're moving it now costs extra money because someone's got to take it down and someone's got to rebuild it. Not to mention the cement that you've already used that you cannot reuse. So you might be able to reuse the blocks but you won't be able to reuse the cement. So you waste money in that sense, you know. You, you've, seen, you've seen it happen to us because, you know, we had a plan and then I came along and I said, oh, Kwame, I don't like this thing here and then we ended up pulling down a wall and it costs money, you know. 
So if you're someone who's on a particularly tight budget and you really don't want to think about doing something twice, then you need to be very, very careful about how you're planning things on paper uh, or and um, how you really want things to flow in the house. Our house is quite unique because it's a bit of an upside down mishmash of a house and I really like it that way. It's a very quirky house. It's definitely not a house that is predictable. So rooms, kitchens, all of that, they're all in different places that you wouldn't expect and I like it like that. But, you know, if you're having like a tra traditional star house, just make sure that you're happy with how the, the way that things are flowing, you know. I think it's a really good idea, you know, when people draw things out on the floor so you have a better idea of space. So you make, the idea is that you draw on the floor, you get your land, you draw on the floor, or you put like pieces of wood on the floor, um, according to like, you know, the corridors, the rooms, and so you can actually walk through, so you get a better feel for what something feels like, because sometimes on paper something seems okay, and then when you bring it, when it starts to come up from the ground, it's like, nah, this is not what I was expecting. So that's another place that things can really catch you out on. So be careful with that, be careful with that. Make sure you're happy with something before it's too late, okay? If there's a change that you need to make, right? This is my, this is, this is my personal thoughts on it. If there's something that has been done and you're not happy with it, it is better to change it as soon as possible than to think at the end and wish you had done it and it's just gonna cost you even more to do it, okay? Because that is just not worth it to me. If it's a house, if you know you're building your dream home and you want things to be perfect, if there's something that you're not happy with, change it as early as possible. Don't wait for them to have finished plastering the walls and have done the andri on the wall before you think, oh my gosh, I would prefer my AC to go here instead, okay? If, if they're just about to start plastering, it's better you say, you know what, please move the pipes while the wall is unplastered and do it there, rather than wait for them to do it and you'd be hesitating, oh, should I, should I not? And then later on you say, oh yes, I should have done it, because then you would have lost out more. So if you notice something is not right, my thoughts is, change it as soon as possible. Don't wait until it becomes a finished look before you change it because it's just gonna cost you more in the end. Unless you really think that you can live with it. But if you know that, if you're like me, you can't live with something, then it's better that you say now at the beginning than to just, you know, the thing be giving you nightmares for the rest of your life inside that house. You know? But those are my thoughts. But yes, um, yeah, so these are my five cost cutting tips for building here in Ghana. Um, I hope you've enjoyed them. I hope you've learned something new from them. Um, I think these tips are absolutely awesome because these are some of the things that we have learned along the way doing what we're doing and so I think if you can save a few cities here and there I think it's definitely worth trying to do that don't you but anyway guys that is it for today if you haven't already subscribed I would really appreciate if you would do me a favor and hit the subscribe button for me and the notification bell and don't forget to do me a favor and like this video so more people get to see it until next time I'm out no diva